Well, today we're going to wrap up this series that we've called The Struggle is Real. And, uh, and as we do, I just want to mention that next week we'll be into December. You're probably aware of that. Next, next Saturday, actually, I think is December the 1st, if I remember right. So next Sunday we will be into December, so we'll start our Christmas series. We're calling it God With Us, and we're going to examine throughout Scripture how God is with us. And so I hope that you'll be here for that series. We've got several things going on throughout the month of December to help us celebrate. Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday will be on the 9th. We've got the Christmas Offering, the Kids Christmas Sing on the 16th. Of course, our Christmas Eve uh, morning service will be on the 23rd. We'll have an evening service at 5 on the 23rd as well to celebrate Christmas Eve. And so it'll be a great month. So God with us is the sermon series. I hope you'll be here and maybe even invite somebody to come along with you. Well, let's take a look at our two uh, key verses of, of Scripture that we're focused on throughout the Scripture. The first comes to us from John chapter 10 and verse 10. And it says this. It says, The thief does not come, the enemy the devil does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, by now, if you've been with us throughout these five weeks of this series, you should be able to quote that scripture on your own. Uh, maybe Ephesians 6 and like the seven verses that we're going through, maybe not so much. But this one should be uh, quotable for all of you. So the enemy, he doesn't come for anything else except for steal, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says that he has come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And so as we've looked at John chapter 10 and verse 10, we've explored the idea that Jesus' desire for each one of us is that we would have an abundant life, that all of us would have fullness to our life, our marriages, our children, our career, every aspect of our life. It is God's desire that it would be abundant, that it would be full. But, but the conflict comes in that there's a very real enemy that wants nothing more than to steal those things from us. He wants to steal that abundant life from us. He wants to steal all things from us. And so that is the struggle that we find ourselves in. And so throughout this series, we've been going through Ephesians chapter 6 because the writer there, Paul, he has a lot to say about spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is exactly what's described in John chapter 10, verse 10. That is spiritual warfare in a nutshell. God has this desire for us, but the enemy wants to stop it from happening. That is spiritual warfare. And so we've been digging in to Ephesians chapter 6. It has a lot to say about this, how we should battle when we're in the struggle, how we should fight back. So let's pick it up in verse 10. It says, finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The power comes from the Lord. Put on the full armor of God. What is significant there? The fact that he says put on the full armor of God. We can't just put on part of the armor of God. We have to put on the full armor of God. Why? So that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. Because the devil, our enemy, Satan, he has a well thought out, well designed plan to get us. To stop us from getting what it is God wants us to have the most. And so we've got to be able to stand against those devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against people, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, there's this unseen realm where there is a struggle, there's a battle going on, and so we've got to make sure that we first understand that our struggle is not against another person. Our struggle is against these forces. And so it says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take, to be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, it continues, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We talked about that a few weeks ago. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. We talked about that in week three. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We talked about that one last week. In addition to all this, take up that shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And, and then today, we're going to look at the next verse where it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it's important for all of us as we get started to understand the helmet uh, as it was used by Roman soldiers in particular back in the day. We've got to understand how it functioned. The, the helmet for Roman soldiers, it certainly protected them from arrows that were shot in their direction. We talked about arrows last week. But the helmet back then, it protected the soldier's head. These arrows that, as we discussed last week, would fly through the air with the intention of killing the soldier. If an arrow hit a soldier in the head without his helmet on, it would kill him. An arrow, especially a flaming arrow, to the head is a deadly blow. Now that's not what I want to focus on today, but I think that this goes hand in hand with the shield of faith that we talked about last week. Let me, let me say it this way in case 
case you're not tracking with me. If one of your enemies flaming arrows, the doubts, the confusion, the chaos that we talked about last week, if one of those flaming arrows gets into your head, it can be life-ending. The devil's lies can become firmly planted in our minds, and that very thing can bring us down. We must have not only that shield of faith that we discussed last week, but we must also have our helmet of salvation firmly in place, because if those arrows get into our minds, it can be the end for us. I have seen it happen time and time again. A doubt, a moment of confusion, something gets twisted, a relationship perhaps, and it gets firmly implanted in somebody's mind or in their, in their head, and they just cannot battle their way back from it. And it causes them to leave faith that they knew or leave a relationship that they knew. That helmet of salvation protects you and me from that very kind of attack. But the helmet of salvation, it does more than just protect us from arrows. You see, back then also, they had this type of sword that was called the broad sword. And this broad sword, it was about four feet long and it was, it was fairly wide. And the soldier would have to grab this sword with both hands, kind of like a baseball bat. And the soldier would take the broad sword up over his head, and then he would bring it down onto the opponent's head with a striking blow. So the soldier would put on this helmet to protect his head from the broad sword. Now you're probably asking very logically, Pastor, what does this helmet look like? Well, I did some research, and I was able to find an exact replica of the helmet that the soldiers wore back then. Do you want to see it? Yeah, I was able to find one. It's, it's an exact replica of what the soldiers wore back then. Mostly Roman soldiers wore this, uh, but it's an exact replica, and we would call this the helmet of salvation. Come on, somebody. Come on. They put a hurting on the Titans last week. They're going to hurt the Dolphins today. Come on, the helmet of salvation. All right, maybe the helmet of salvation doesn't quite look like this. Or the helmets that the Roman guards wore back then. Probably not. Probably not this, but they're God's team, so it's all right. <laughs> the helmet of salvation. Now, let me, let me just jump into what we're going to talk about today. There are some that say, and I've heard it, I'm sure you've probably heard it too, that the helmet of salvation referenced here in Ephesians chapter 6 refers to being saved. And that could be, but I'm not so sure. It could, it could refer to the fact that, that we all need to be saved in order to be protected, but I'm not so sure that that's what it's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 6. Being saved or giving your heart to Jesus, saying yes to Jesus, the salvation moment doesn't really make any sense when we consider the verse, does it? If we're going into, into the battle and we're going to win over the demonic forces, we're going to win over the devil, salvation cannot be the fifth thing in the list. Salvation cannot be the fifth thing that we put on. It must be the first thing that we put on. It doesn't make sense for Paul to say all of these other pieces of the armor first and then almost last say, and by the way, get saved. It doesn't make any sense, does it? I don't think that's really what Paul's saying. In fact... In fact, in these verses, Paul is actually writing to Christians. This, this book of the Bible is written to Christians, so they, they've already gotten saved. And so if we, use, if we use that logic, it just doesn't make sense. So it begs the question, so then what is that helmet of salvation? What is it that Paul's referring to in Ephesians chapter 6? Well, it takes a little bit more of research, a little more digging into Scripture, but I think that Paul is saying that the helmet of salvation is the very thing that gives us hope. You can write it down in your outlines. Point number one, hope is what comes with the helmet of salvation. Hope. It's hope. He's referring to hope, everybody. Pastor, how do you know that? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. It says there very similarly, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, that sounds familiar, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. 
same writer. Paul is writing both of these things. Don't you think that that gives us insight into that helmet of salvation? Here we see very clearly he's talking about hope. Hope is the, is the, is the salvation. The helmet of salvation is directly connected to our hope. Everybody say hope. The church of Thessalonica, they were struggling at this time with their hope. They actually thought in this church that the second coming of Jesus Christ had already happened and they missed it and they were losing their hope. And so Paul is writing to them in this book to tell them to not lose hope. And he uses the helmet of salvation as his reference of hope. It's hope. Hope. It's this expectation of something good. It's looking forward to something good happening in your life. I don't know about your home, but if you have kids, maybe you can relate. My kids are so excited for Christmas. They're talking about it all the time. I think somebody asked Joel here in the last week or so, they said, what's Thanksgiving all about? And he said, putting up the Christmas tree. It's all about Christmas in my home. I'm sure my kids are even dreaming about Christmas. Do you remember the dreams that you used to have as a kid leading up to Christmas? And my kids are getting more and more excited as the days go by as we approach Christmas Day. My kids are full of hope. They expect that something good is going to happen on that day. You probably remember that feeling as a kid, being full of hope. And maybe for you, you have sickness in your body, but you're looking forward to healing coming your way. You're full of hope. Maybe you have kids who aren't serving the Lord, but you're looking forward to hope when the, when the day comes that they'll return to the Lord. Maybe your, your marriage isn't going well, but you're looking forward to the day when you and your spouse have the marriage that you've always desired. You're full of hope. Maybe it's your job and you're looking forward with hope to the day that you get a raise or you get that promotion that you've longed after. Maybe you're in school and you look forward to the day when you're finally done with education. You're full of hope. Maybe you haven't felt close to God lately, but you're looking forward to a closer walk with Him, full of hope. Maybe you have a bad habit or an addiction that you're looking forward to with hope finally being free from. Maybe you're looking forward to hope in heaven. Anybody here looking forward to heaven? I know I am. Look, this, this world is not all that there is. We have maybe 80 years here, but we get to spend eternity there. I am looking forward full of hope and expectation to the day that I get to heaven. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. No more sickness, no more sin, no more abuse, no more rape, no more chaos. I'm looking forward to that day. Anybody with me? I have a hope for heaven. I have a hope for a future. I believe God is up to something right here, in fact. I believe the best is truly yet to come. I have a hope for a future with my wife. I think the best days for me and her are yet to come. I'm full of hope. I'm full of hope for my kids' future. I don't look at my kids with despair. I look at my kids full of hope. Full of hope. I believe my kids are going to be world changers for Jesus. I'm full of hope. I look at my marriage, my kids. I look at this church, and I am full of hope, everybody. I look at what we did at the food pantry this last Monday where we served over 100 families. I am full of hope. The best days are yet to come. The best days are yet to come. Anybody got hope in the house today? I'm full of hope. Hope. Hope is so important to winning the battle. One of Satan's most effective schemes is to rob us of our hope. He attacks us with discouragement. Hope, though, is key to being victorious. I heard it put this way that a man can live about 40 days without food. He can live about eight days without water. He can live four minutes without air, but he can't live one second without hope. You and I need the hope of salvation as a helmet to wear in the battle. The Bible, it talks so much about hope. We couldn't possibly cover all of the scriptures, but I do want to share a few with you. 
Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is a God of hope. If you're here today and you think for a moment that God put this hopeless feeling in you, you're wrong. God is the God of hope. If you're thinking that the despair you feel today is somehow coming from the Lord, you're wrong. He is the God of hope. His desire for you is that you overflow with hope. Hopelessness is not the will of God for us. If you feel defeated today, that's not from God. His desire for you is that you would be overflowing with hope, everybody. Hope. 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. In other words, don't put your hope in feelings or emotions. Feelings and emotions, they're up and down all the time. One moment you feel happy, and then just seconds later, you can feel sad. One moment you're on top of the world, and the next you just want to pull the covers up over your head and not get out of bed that day. Your feelings will lie to you. And they are no place to find hope. Jesus is our hope. Other people are not our hope. Your husband or your wife is not your hope. Your kids are not your hope. Your pastor is not your hope. Your friends are not your hope. Your tribe is not your hope. Your boss is not your hope. Jesus Christ is your hope. Don't put your hope in things. Money is not your hope. I hope you're getting this today. Vacations are not your hope. Fridays are not your hope. Instead of saying TGIF, we need to say TGIJ. Not thank God it's Friday, but thank God it's Jesus. Jesus is our hope. If we put our hope in, in things or in people, we will be disappointed, frustrated, disillusioned, and discouraged all the time. But Jesus is a hope that never disappoints. Jesus is our hope. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, we remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say the word endurance. Say it again, endurance. Let that get into your heart. Endurance can be a key to winning the battle. When your hope is in Jesus, you have endurance to run the race. You have the resolve to keep fighting. When your back is against the rope, Hope gives you the endurance to keep on fighting, to throw one more punch. Endurance is found in hope. And listen, I've got some bad news for you. Most battles are not won overnight. Most battles go on for hours and days and weeks, months, even years. And you can tell when the devil is attacking someone's hope because they lose their willingness to put up a fight. They lose their endurance. And for some of you today, you've lost your hope. You're saying, even in your own mind, that you just don't have anything left. You can't fight another day. You're ready to give up. You just don't think you can fight any longer. Can I tell you why that's happening? The devil has grabbed that broadsword, and he's lifted it over his head, and he is coming down, and he is striking you on the head. He's striking you on the head. And you're going around without your helmet of salvation, which is hope in God, hope in Jesus Christ. He's robbed you of hope, and He is hitting you over the head with the broadsword. For some of you, you've been married for years, but you're ready to throw in the towel. I'm sick of him. I'm sick of her. You're ready to call it quits. The devil has taken that broadsword over his head, and he's hit you over the head. Some of you, it's kids. You feel hopeless. They're grown. They're not in church. They're addicted to this. They're addicted to that. They're in and out of jail. It's hopeless. Or maybe for you, your kid is, is a seven-year-old who's strong-willed and rebellious. How many know a seven-year-old can be pretty rebellious? And you feel hopeless. He's hitting you over the head with the broadsword. And you begin to think to yourself, why do I even try? Why do I even try? For others, it's money or it's your job. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I don't even know how I'm going to make it. I'm, I'm so sick of this. I hate my job. I hate my boss. I'm always stressed and anxious. Why do I even try? The devil's picked up that broadsword and he is 
coming down on your head. For others, it's relationships. You say, I don't have any friends. I've been hurt. And the devil, he's whispering in your ear that you'll never have any friends. You've resigned yourself to live a life alone. And the enemy, he is just coming down on top of your head with that broadsword. He's caused you to feel hopeless. He's robbing you of your hope. Hope is a key to winning the battle over our enemy. If you don't have hope, you will not stay in the battle. You will give in and you will give up. We have to believe with all that we are that God will help us achieve victory. We have to believe that God will help us in our day of trouble. If we do not believe that, we will lose. If we don't believe that one day it will turn around for the better, we will lose. If we don't have hope, we will lose. Familiar scripture from Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Listen, everybody, God has a plan for you. Somebody needs to hear that today. God has a plan for you. And it's not just a plan, but it's a plan intended to give you hope. Sometimes when we're in the middle of the battle, we can begin to imagine that God's plan for us is disaster and chaos. Chaos. If we go solely based off of what, what we see around us. But God's plan is a good one that is full of hope. God's plan is that trouble won't last forever. We have to believe that God's plan is not to harm us, not to hurt us, but to give us hope and to give us a future. I can say this with full confidence over everybody here today. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come for you. The best is yet to come for me. But you have to believe it. You have to receive that. You have to have hope that is only found in Jesus Christ. The best is yet to come, everybody. Even if it doesn't turn around for you here on earth, heaven is coming, and that means the best is yet to come for you. That's the place for a good amen, isn't it? There is hope, everybody. Here's the last piece of armor that I want to share with you in this series. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's interesting that that helmet of salvation, it protects us from the broadsword of the enemy. But then, but then we hear that we also have a sword. We have the sword of the Spirit. And all of the first five pieces of armor, they are defensive pieces. But the sword, the sword is an offensive weapon, isn't it? Write that down on your outline. The sword of the Spirit is an offensive weapon. This sword that God gives us is an offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit. We can use this to defeat the enemy. And you know, in this verse, it talks about the Word of God. And you know that word, word, in that scripture, in Ephesians 6, it's not the word logos, but it's the word rima. Rima, R-H-E-M-A, rima. Which means that it's a word that is led by the Spirit. It means that it's a right now word. It's a right now word. There are times when you're in the battle. And you need to pick up the sword. And you can't just say, wait, 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 wait. Time out for just a second, devil. I, I got to go get my Bible and open up and find a verse to fight back with. That's, that's not what's going to happen. You're not going to have the time to do that. I don't go to church. I don't read my Bible. So I need to find a word that I can battle back and fight, at, fight with the word as my weapon. No, no, no. Paul is saying here, there are going to be times when you're in the battle and you're going to need a right now word. There's no time for a timeout. You need a word from the word. You need a word from the word. That's that sword of the spirit. That's a right now Rima word. Let me show it to you in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus shows this very clearly starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Maybe you know this story. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter, the devil, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You see, in this moment, the enemy tempts Jesus with the sin of pleasure. 
the sin of pleasure. And the enemy, the enemy is trying to get all of us to go down that path all of the time. You're supposed to be fasting, so he tempts with pleasure. Feed your flesh. You can hear him, can't you? Make yourself happy. Feed that desire. It's that sin of pleasure. But how does Jesus respond? Well, Jesus responds, he says, it is written. He didn't say, wait a minute, time out, time out. Let me go, let me go get my Bible out. Let me look. No, no, he says, it is written. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, that's from Deuteronomy 8.3. He's using the word of God to fight. That's his sword. And listen, I know that I say it a lot, but you got to read your Bible, everybody. You must get into the word for yourself. You must read the Bible. In fact, this is so important to me that after the first of the year, beginning in the second week of January, we're going to do a whole series on the Bible. We're going we're to challenge everybody to read the Bible. We're going to do a sermon series on the Bible. I cannot stress for everybody how important it is that you get into the Word of God. And can I just submit that it's of vital importance. It is vital for you, if for no other reason to help you win the battle. Some weeks you may be thinking, sitting out there on a Sunday, thinking to yourself, well, the sermon, it, it's fine, but it's not for me. It's, it's not relevant for me today. Listen, listen, I teach the Word of God. I teach the Word of God. This is not some motivational speech for you. You may think that the sermon is, is, relevant, is not relevant for you today, but when the devil is pressing in on you, you have something you can draw from because we are teaching the Word of God each and every week. You have been hearing teaching from the Word that gives you a weapon to fight when you need it. And so, in the story of Jesus, he wins that battle. But then it continues. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Can I just remind you that the devil knows the Bible too? But he always twists it for his benefit. He doesn't rightly divide the word. He twists it. That's why you have to know it, everybody. Because he will quote scripture to you. But you have to know what it says so you can fight back. You have to rightly divide it. That's why you have to understand the context of what's written there. You have to know the verses before and the verse after your favorite verse in order to apply it correctly. You can't just take a single verse out of context and expect it to be the right now word that you need. The devil knows the Bible and you have to know it too or else you will hear uh, what you will hear will sound biblical and it will sound right but it's twisted for his own benefit and here we see the devil tempt jesus with the sin of power first it's the sin of pleasure now it's the sin of power you're powerful come on show us just how powerful you are he tempts us the same doesn't he you're powerful you don't need anyone else you don't need to go to church you don't need to read your Bible. You don't need to be in a small group. You don't need to do those things. You're powerful. You can do it on your own. You don't need anybody else. You can do it on your own. It's a sin of power. Thinking that you don't need God. And that you have all the power you need. So Jesus responds. He says again, it is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. It's Deuteronomy 6.16. He's fighting back with the word Jesus beat him with the word again and so feeling defeated I'm sure the devil then he continues took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor all this I will give you he said if you will bow down and worship me the sin of pleasure the sin of power and here's the sin of possessions the devil says I'll give you everything you ever need if you'll serve me I'll give, you, I'll give you money. I'll give you success. I'll get you to the top. All you need to do is serve me. Don't, don't worry about God. I can give you everything you need, everything you ever wanted. Besides, you, you deserve these things. It's the sin of possessions. So how does Jesus respond? You can probably guess. He says, away from me, Satan, for it is written... 
Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. That was a quote from Deuteronomy 6.13. Once again, Jesus here, he used the word of God as his sword, as his offensive weapon. There is power in speaking the word of God. When you speak the word of God, there is power. When Jesus spoke the word of God, the devil fled. The devil ran away. You want victory in your life? You want to win the struggle, win the battle over your enemy? Use the word of God. So I want to close today by revisiting a theme that I've shared throughout this story. And it's this. The full armor of God gives you victory. The full armor of God gives you victory. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on back up. Not just wearing one or two pieces. It's having all of it on every day. It's a daily suiting up. It's putting on that armor every day because every day is a battle. How many know what I'm talking about? Every day is a battle. You're in it. And just when you think you've won and you can take a day off, the attack ramps back up and you're back in it again. Put on the full armor of God and you will be victorious. You want the devil to flee? You want him to run in the opposite direction? If you want Satan to run the other way when he sees you coming, you must do what it says in James 4, 7. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you catch it? Did you catch it there? You must submit yourself to God. That's the first step. You've got to submit yourself to God. Resisting the devil... It comes with the full armor of God, but you must first ask yourself, am I fully submitted to God? Is my marriage submitted to God? Are my relationships submitted to God? Are the things that I watch on TV or in movies, are the things that I listen to, is my job, is my time, are my kids, are they fully submitted to God? Because when we submit ourselves to God and the authority of His Word, we are able to resist the devil and he will flee. Some of you, you need the devil to flee from your marriage. Some of you, you need the devil to flee from your mind. For others, you need him to flee from your kids or flee from your finances or flee from your job. Resist the devil. Put on the full armor of God, and he will flee from you. How do I know? Because I've seen it time and time again. And because the word of God tells me. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. He is faithful, and he will protect you. Bow your heads and close your eyes, everybody. I want to invite you right now just to ask the Holy Spirit, what is it? What is it that you're trying to say to me right now? What is it you want me to hear through this message? As God speaks to you, I just want to encourage you to somehow document what you've heard. What is it that he's saying to you? Maybe you've lost hope. And God is saying, you've placed your hope in the wrong things. You need to put your hope in me. Or maybe he's saying to you, you've not used the offensive weapon that I've given you. You're not in your word. You're not seeing what, what, what my word is telling you. Use it in the midst of the battle. Quote scripture. Fight back against the enemy. Or maybe he's saying there's an area of your life that you've not fully submitted to him. 
and he's saying to you today give it to me I can take it when you submit it to me it's better because when you do that the enemy will flee why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet and I want to encourage everybody to just move from your seat and come to the front altar area go ahead and move from where you are don't delay just go ahead and move I thought a great way just to close out our series and this message in particular is us just worshiping together as family And, you know, I mentioned last week that, you know, we should be side by side, fighting together in unity. So the worship team, they've got a great song that I know will be familiar to you. And this is our battle cry. This is how we fight. So I just want to encourage you to press in, seek after God in your worship, and let's sing out to Him together.
God, may we forever be reminded of that moment in each of our lives when we first said yes, when we first turned our lives over to you and the amazing grace that came along with that moment. And God, may we just know more and more with each day that passes that, God, your mercies are new every day, that God, that you extend to us grace beyond what we deserve, that God, that you took on the punishment through your son, Jesus Christ, that we deserved. And so, God, as we battle, as we fight, as we put on the helmet of salvation and pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is your word, God, may we just find more and more victory that you intend for us. And, God, may we step fully into the abundant life that you intend for us. And so, God, I I speak victory over everyone here today, that, God, may the blessing of your victory come quickly in their lives. And, God, may they not lose hope, that they may turn to the hope giver, in the most hopeless of situations. And God, may they find victory in those moments. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Can I just remind you that we will be decorating for Christmas immediately following the 11 a.m. service. So if you're headed out to lunch or a meal, come back and join us at 1230. Help us out. We'll be decorating the church for Christmas. We could use all hands on deck. And now the blessing, if you'll receive it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you find victory in the battle. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great Sunday.